Greetings, it is I, Tentus Narapan Shikovic, your Lord and Emperor here at the Shikovic Empire, and welcome back to the world of darkness. Yes, we're diving once again deep into interesting game setting that has such great games as the one we're going to be talking about today, Vampire the Masquerade. If you're not familiar with the world of darkness, well, i got plenty of videos to help educate you on it. When this is a very interesting one to start out with, because we're talking about the sex within Vampire the Masquerade. A world where you're playing a vampire and dealing with the politics, and the fact that you are a monster in human flesh. Anyway, today, as I said, we're diving into the Anarchs. And the Anarchs are an interesting group because for the longest time they were effectively a faction within the Camarilla. It's only of more recent time periods that um, they've broken apart and become something of their own. The Anarch Movement. They, they were already sort of called that, the Anarch Movement, but now they are their own thing and have become a faction in certain areas of the world. Are they very widespread? Not really that widespread as per se something like the Camarilla, the Sabbat would be, and many other vampire organizations, but they've found themselves with more power as of late because of becoming more independent and more influenced. We'll dive into it. Now, some recommended reading, depending on your various um, editions that you're working with. I can throw out some here. Uh, first off, uh, if you're looking for the earliest edition, the Anarch Cookbook. Um, granted, is a mixed bag on vampire politics, but it introduces us to the idea of the Anarchs in the earliest times of vampire. Uh, the Guide to the Anarchs was the first major book that I would say recommend. For These are the uh, first editions, revised editions, these is the earliest time period when we're looking into it. If we get into the V20 time period, Anarchs Unbound is a good one to look at uh, for when we have post the end of the world stuff that kind of broke the original uh, sets of uh, adventures for World of Darkness. And there is even a 5th edition book, Anarch, if you want to dive into using 5th edition. Again, um, I've said my preference on many of these videos. I'm not a huge fan of 5th edition when it comes to a lot of their mechanics. I don't mind a lot of their mixed bag on their lore stuff. Uh, but we're going to be talking about on the side of their lore stuff here. As, you know, I, as much as I'm a mixed bag of fan of it, I still talk about it. And again, my main grief is with the uh, <laughs> mechanics of 5th edition Vampire. Not the actual, not most of the storyline. But, uh, my recommendation is always V20. Uh, and then maybe bring in some of the storyline as you wish. But, it's up to you. And that's why we're going to talk about it today and dive into a lot of this stuff. And let you make decisions on your own. Uh, now, here is our revised Anarch symbol. So this is the symbol that would have been used for if you're still a member of the Camarilla Anarchs. So the idea of Anarchs as a vampire is they want to break the status quo of the Canite society, of vampire society. And their main movement behind this, of course, is the Anarch movement. Uh, that's the main organization that actually they have. They were traditionally in areas of Southern California, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco was their strongholds. Um, and they do date back to the 15th century. So they are a very old sect, technically. Um, and it was until about 2012, they were technically allied with the Camarilla. So you can see that they have this deep connection with the Camarilla, uh, the Camarilla, that has lasted for a long time, but now they've more or less broken away in a way. Broken away. Way? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Anarch as a term in vampire refers to a rebel kindred, doesn't respect their elder, elders, um, 
a lot of fledglings are assumed to be anarchs by their elders, and uh, it's looked as to be a kind of despised product of the 20th century. So there is, in amongst older vampire society, this derogatory, derogatory term of anarch. The idea of an actual anarch and a member of the anarch movement is one that resents the privileged status held by elders within the uh, Camarilla and other sects. Um, basically, the eldest still hold uh, the most power in societies of the, the mortals, and a lot of younger vampires don't find this a very happy situation. Um, a lot of these younger vampires, though, tend to be targeted by the Sabbat because of this resentment makes them very good recruitment targets in a way doesn't mean they always join with them of course but you know it it's a target point that there are of those that do join it the thing is though while the sabbat has this loose idea of coming up with their own traditions they kind of look to the masquerade but really want to break it down and don't want to have a lot of the other traditions the idea is that anarchs an actual anarch has is they do respect and uphold the masquerade that part of it is very important to them and there are some of the other traditions that the Camarilla have come about with that they do see as very important you know they don't respect the vampires who enforce them or the systems that benefit from these, but they understand it. It's sort of like the step between someone that sees a bunch of laws and says, you know, these these sets of laws, they, they are there for a reason, but they're not necessarily fair. And maybe we should change some of these. That's more of an anarch. And those that go all the way to the Sabbat would say like, hey, let's burn it down. You know, there's the kind of difference between the two of them is you're, they're taking a step, but not taking the second step to go too far uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, under the terms of the Convention of Thorns, uh, if you do not recall the Convention of Thorns, I've talked about it a few times, but that was the peace agreement between the Camarilla the Anarchs of the 15th century and the Asimite clan made uh, basically to end the first Anarch revolt. The Anarchs were considered a part, a faction of the Camarilla uh, by its members. Um, but, and this lasted again, of course, till the early 20th, uh, first century, as I said, until 20, 20, uh, 2012. And very different than, of course, the Sabbat, who came about after that kind of deal, they were tolerated. So they were kind of like annoying, but tolerated. Anyway, this is the fifth edition uh, symbol for Anarchs, if you want to use one. So, of course, as I've just said now, the Anarch Revolt which birthed the Sabbat, birthed also the Anarch movement itself. So, historically, it's very much more tied. And yes, there are some similarities in the attitude, as I described. But the Sabbat take it to a much more extreme. It's the two sets of... A, it's a movement that goes to a certain degree, but some went farther. Now, there are some older movements that do link to this here, too. Uh, there was the Promethean movement during the Dark Ages um, that wanted to recreate the idea of Carthage where kindred and kind were kind of in harmony, very much more early ancient vampire days. Uh, there was also the Fiores movement, um, which was um, some disenfranchised members within Clan Brugia that uh, they had some infighting and some problems with that kind of thing. Um, but these movements kind of set together things. In more recent nights, though, the general idea of the Anarchs and the Anarch movement is they're basically unorganized rabble of younger vampires and caitiff. Uh, caitiff being the clanless vampires who are like either 
uh, specifically clanless or those that have, because um, it's a complicated term, two meanings, or those that have um, basically been disavowed by their clans. So, um, anyway. The Anarch name was originally given to them by the, Canar the Camarilla elders um, because they sought to overthrow Canite structure during the first Anarch result. And yes, the idea that mo many Anarchs are anarchists is a thing. It, it tends to actually be that the, the desires, especially now more in days, is to bring equality and democracy, or at least uh, meritocracy, to kindred society. Um, democracy might not work for them, so some kind of meritocracy might be, you know, at very least a position you can get to. So, these modern knights, nowadays, anarchs have, are kind of on the fringes of kindred society, and the banner of the anarch movement is where they gather. This is where they have organization. Um, the biggest thing that they did was the second Anarch result. Um, it was a large coup uh, against the tyrannical elders and sects uh, that were positioned, of course, in Southern California. They liberated uh, Los Angeles in 1944, and within a year, established what would be called the Anarch Free State okay, uh, uh, within Southern and Central California. They overthrew princes of these liberated cities, established places uh, with Anarch barons. We'll talk about their organization. And were given a much more tolerant and a, a, a authority over their fellow Anarchs. So just as a step back, um, the second Anarch re 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 Revolt, because we do want to talk about this for a second in this case, and the Anarch Free State a little bit here, because uh, of the formation of that, is that there were a lot of tensions that happened, of course, over the years. Um, a lot of Anarchs, of course, the remaining ones from Europe, from the old time, made their way to the U.S., because it was a new world. It was away from a lot of the elders. And um, many ended up on the West Coast. Los Angeles became an increasing area of Anarch, kind of like congregation. If you were an Anarch or wanted to join them, that's where you would travel to from wherever you were. Um, a Don Sebastian was a prince that was put in charge of that, who basically was made to curb the growing number of Anarchs in the lead region. He kind of ignored them for a long time, um, but then in a savage beating of one Jeremy, Jeremy McNeil, uh, who was an important member of the Anarchs, it basically changed something. Because McNeil um, it was only beaten. And, and didn't rebel then, and basically studied up on where to find all the local elders, and then um, on December 21st, 1944, the revolt began. The prince was killed, many of the elders were either destroyed or fled the city, and uh, the Anarchs had a huge victory. That was the revolt. The result. Um, they moved to San Diego and attempted to liberate San Francisco, um, the current prince of San Francisco repelled them, but they eventually drove them out, and the Anarch Free State was formed. Um, it was the principles of the perfect state they were ruled under, uh, which it still kind of exists today. We'll talk about that. It basically became an area dominated by roving gangs that were kind of at each other's throats. There wasn't really a great organization. They didn't really create a perfect society, and there was things like the New Promise Mandate, which attempted to kind of fix it, but the Free State was effectively collapsed by 2000. Effectively. 
So, again, it, it's something that it, it technically kind of exists, but a lot of stuff happened in the late 20th century that also helped not lead to anything very well. And in late 1900s, you know, 1999, around then, um, a lot of things happened that caused a lot of issues. And currently, there were things like equation invasion during that time. Um, basically, that mostly destroyed the Anarch Free State. So, and that's the main kind of history of what would be the Anarch Free State, which was the attempt for Anarchs to have a great deal of power. Now, this doesn't say that the Anarchs haven't done more. There's some, you know, people as Anarchs. So, let's talk about breaking from the Camarilla. So, the movement had a lot of losses. By the early 21st century, the Anarch Free State is basically broken. Um, there isn't really a major organization. The movement doesn't have a hierarchy as it was. But the Anarch movement has seen some more relevance and some strengthening because of the Second Inquisition. And things that have happened is, of course, we had... Um, in 2020, 2012, the Third Anarch Revolt, which was the Brugia betraying the Camarilla and basically starting a new Anarch Revolt across Europe. Um, some bastions, including select like Berlin, falling to Anarchs. So this drove them from the Camarilla. Uh, the Sabbat has also abandoned a lot of domains because of their Gehenna War. Um, the Bruja that weren't already in followed Theo Bell and joined. And actually the ministry, who had been trying to court uh, basically the group that was formerly the followers of said they're now the most ministry. Um, uh, that's a thing to talk about, you know. Um, that's a different thing to talk about. But they were trying to court the Camarilla and kind of join with them. Their dealings didn't work. They joined the Anarchs. So, follow that by a lot of Caitiff and Thin Bloods being kind of um, embraced, needing a home, and the movement being a great place to it. A lot of younger Semiche uh, seeing that they weren't, they didn't have a great place in the Sabbat and needing some place, again, caused the Anarch movement to kind of swell with these new groups and new members. Um, Los Angeles kind of has had a resurgence. While the free state has been broken, Los Angeles, a domain in decline, has become a hotbed for the Savic story again. Uh, the barons of the cities um, basically have had been re-emboldened, resurgences of members after 2004, uh, with the withdrawal of the Camarilla and the Sabbat, and... Um, most of them, and only really um, now have to contend with the transplanted uh, Prince Veneer Thomas and his restrictive policies intended to combat them. Um, so. There's basically still... The Second Inquisition still had some influence on that entire thing, you know. Um, he kind of moved to Los Angeles to kind of fight against it and um, has had some dealings with the Anarchs and whether or not he still exists, at least his group, he could have been killed in the ensuing conflict. So, let's talk about how, now that we know the history, kind of a little bit about how the Anarchs work, about their organization. Because again, they're just, we don't like the status quo, we would like to change it, but there's some pretty good rules in place here. They're like the, they're moderate people in a way. 
Uh, they're not very huge traditionalists. They're, they're people that don't want very extreme changes. They just want some changes. A lot of changes, but, you know, important ones, no. And that's the thing is, Anarchs aren't really a sect in most areas, per se. They've been kind of this faction on the fringes of Camarilla's hierarchy in society most of the time. The Anarch movement and its loose organizations having come about really mostly during the 20th century have caused, especially even with their decline of the free state, the reemergence now means that this entire history that they've had over the last century is establishing their own traditions, power blocks, territories, trappings, that they have become finally their own sect. It has taken a lot to break away finally and, you know, just no longer be these fringes that they're kind of looked down upon. There is, on a very functional level, the fact that the Anarch movement fulfills a lot of functions that are just reorganized things that the Camarilla proper would have had. There are barons that have their advisors and enforcers. They're often guided by a council of their peers. Uh, some of them even have a standing of a coterie of bruisers, investigators for police and military duties. Um, a lot of these, those don't have positions and titles connected to these positions. So these officers and positions, they don't have titles. They're, some of them do. They're really kind of there. Um, when an anarch leader has a need for such an office... Um, it's sort of when the a large portion of the subset recognizes a need for them. Um, you know, it's, we need someone to be put in charge here. That's why we have a baron. You know, and the Anarchs aren't going to admit that to the rest of the vampire world that, you know, even in their own kind, that, you know, this is why we we need this and we have to put this in here because it keeps us in check in a lot of ways. So yes, Baron is basically a prince. I talked a little bit about princes in my Camarilla video. I'd say check it out. It, you know, um, I recommend it. It's in the playlist here um, that this isn't going to be a member of. But Baron is a mem is basically effectively the same. They're not quite the same. Um, a city could have two recognizable barons with different jurisdictions in the city. Um, sometimes with arrivals, but more often these barons work cooperatively. So basically, while a prince will control one city, yes, there are cities that places that could have one baron, but it's the idea of there are enough barons within a area that is to control it as necessary. The thing is, a baron has the responsibilities of prince, but doesn't have the tools that a prince would have. And I think that's one of the main reasons why you oftentimes in larger jurisdictions or more difficult jurisdictions find more. Um, so it's effectively an administrator to a city or territory. That's what a, a baron is. They don't pass a lot of policies... Um, they avoid dictating a lot of behavior and those under them. It's basically meeting disputes between various parties. Um, and basically to make sure if there is a dispute, it doesn't get out of hand. That's really the thing is there. So the Baron is there to basically be a little bit of a figurehead. They're not doing any major things here in this, in, in, in their territory, a lot of times, they're basically like, oh, something's going on. Do I have to get involved? Let me keep an eye on it. Oh, I have to get involved. You know. And again, an anarch can come to a baron with a problem. Um, you know, it's something could be going on that they're like, hey, I'm having this conflict. Uh, you know, I need, you know, some mediation in it. Um, and it, oftentimes that would be the one that's losing, of course. Um, but the Baron is going to try to mediate that kind of thing. That's their job, in a way. 
Um, and, you know, <sighs> motivation for a Baron, kind of hard to say. They, resp they It's basically almost more responsibility than seeking power. Um, they want the goal, the goals and well-being of their sect more than anything. So, a lot of barons look at this as civic duty more than a power grab, which a lot of princes would. So it's a different attitude in general. Uh, now, other than that, there are a few other named fa uh, uh, roles that are within the Anarch movement. There are emissaries. They're the ones that c carry the olive branch negotiations to other sects. Uh, they haggle, play games, uh, diplomacy, all trying to keep the movement to survive, basically. They're ambassadors, hailer, uh, heralds, um, and there are some cynical members of the sex that will call them expendables because, honestly, they're not there for battle. They're there for negotiations, and things don't happen well. And they will act as negotiators for a baron or barony area, or even the sect as a whole. And they will also negotiate not only with other barons, like if there is a conflict between barons, there would be negotiations that require an emissary, but especially most of the time, other sets. A lot of them work with the Camarilla because though, again, breaking apart, they are the most agreeable. Um... Working with a Sabbat bishop, very much more difficult. And things like in the former, uh, the free, the Anarch Free State, where the Quaijin invaded uh, and the New Promise uh, uh, Mandriate happened, they will work with the Quaijin. Uh, again, noting the uh, New Promise uh, Mandriate uh, is the Quaijin, the eastern vampires outside of the Middle Kingdom area on the west coast. So that's the group that settled that area. Um, and the Anarchs, probably much more than the other sects, are one of them um, that tries, at least after their attempts to fight them, uh, establish at least a general contact with them in more modern nights. You know, it was their battle with them that helped break the Free State, unfortunately. They're, they're showing up. Sweepers. Basically, a sweeper has a very simple duty in amongst Anarchs. He walks around, checks out other vampires in the Anarch ter territory, keeps names, faces, attitudes, abilities, clan ancestries, anything else they can discover about them. They make notes about who's who, that's a vampire, in a baron's area. Um, a, a baron will call them more like a counter or census taker, but anarchs in general, the general populace, will call them a sweeper, a proctor, Sherlock, or even an abacus. Uh, those are some nicknames for them. So basically, they keep track of stuff in an anarch domain. Uh, that's the idea of it. They get information. They know who's the new, new people that are in town. And, you know... If a baron needs to know this information or wants to know this information, they're ready with it. And honestly, a baron would want to know this information, have their domain properly managed. You know, who who's shown up? Who are they? What do I know about them? What can I know about them? So, you know, you know the amount of sweeper you'll have depends on, again, how big your territory is. If you don't have a lot of vampires, you don't have to have a, a lot of stuff there. Um, but there are still tyrannical barons that are out there, you know. Not all people in a position are made equally. So there are those that use them to track kindred in their main and what they're up to. But, you know, kind of use it as abusive power um, sometimes. Though there are annex that will just kill a sweeper, you know if uh, they are used in such an abusive way. So, again, it's a role that seemingly has an important cause, but it's a very suspicious one, too. Anarchs are very suspicious of it. 
So, there is a final one, an informal title called Chameleon. Sometimes also known as Bond, Mole, Submarine, Sub. It's basically a spy, or an anarch who holds a position of authority in another sect. Uh, yeah. Most of the time this is Camarilla, though there are some in the new Palmas uh, Mandrake and even the Sabbat who aren't unheard of. Uh, they're experts of deception um, as they have to keep their uh, association with the Anarch Movement secret. Um, it's intelligence gathering, funneling to the various uh, offices within the Anarchs that need to know about these things. Um, they can also transfer funds and resources, kind of stealing some stuff from one group to send it to them. Um, the thing is, they're not something like a kindred of the Camarilla that has anarch sympathies and help the movement under the table. There are those. Chameleons are members of the movement that got their office in the other sect after being part of the movement. Basically, they have this commitment to the Anarch cause. And, you know, a little bit of luck then to be a collaborator after that. And we have one more thing to talk about. The clans and members that represent the Anarch movement. Who's in there? You know? Because... The Anarch movement does end up being a little similar to both the Camarilla and the Sabbat, in a way. Because certainly you have your core membership in the group, but you also have a lot of just randoms that do show up and join it, too. They're not going to be a major membership. Um, so... The Anarch Movement has had representatives from most clans and bloodlines, just like the Camarilla and the Sabbat. But there traditionally are a number of membership clans and groups that are a core to them, especially nowadays. These the traditional clans that are seen as almost low clans and clanless have also had a big movement. Uh, Bruja and Gangrel. Certainly the Gangrel are more of an independent clan now, the Brugia, basically, with the Third Anarch Revolt, becoming a major member of it and gaining some Anarch support in Europe. Um, but there are, even though, again, Gangrel being independent now, there are a bunch of them that are in the Anarch movement. Well, technically speaking, they broke away, became independent. Now, I would say their power basis is kind of split between it. You still have some independence. You have those that would be more considered... Anarch. So Brugia, Gangrel are two big groups within the Anarch movement. Um, a lot of them had formal walkouts that kind of uh, cemented this. Uh, the Ministry, of course. Uh, a chunk of Semiche are here. Uh, the Caitiff, as I talked about it. And of course the uh, Thinbloods or Duskborn. These six groups are the main members of the Anarch movement. They are the strength of it. There are some other clans that do have some representation. Unlike uh, they're the Unchained Malkavians, Red Nosferatu, Abstract Theodor, uh, the uh, Epismius Tremere, and the Free Ventru, as they call themselves. Uh, so these little smaller groups um, are basically what you would refer to these other clans as part of the Anarch movement. Remember, the Anarch movement was a lot of a very heavy Camarilla, these are the other Camarilli clans. So kind of having that connection and meaning that it was probably very easy for a lot of these clan members specifically to gain. Unlike something like the La Sombra in the older days. Now La Sombra are moving from the Sabbat, so that's my change. But again, the disconnection between the Anarchs and the Camarilla means, you know, new Camarilla, harder to do that. And there are other groups that probably have had representation, but just because their positioning in the world or their positions themselves don't have that same connection. Again, so similar. Um, there is one important thing to say here, and it's something to talk about. Um, Vampire 5th Edition doesn't mention the Kwai Jin at all. So, 
hasn't been retconned. What happened to the free states? <clears throat> we haven't found out. They haven't talked about it. There has been no discussion on it. It's just one of those things that Vampire 5th Edition doesn't talk about it. It work, it's, it's the same lore, but not in a way sometimes. So that's just something to keep in mind that um, there hasn't been a talk in V5 about the Quaijin. And, and that's a final note about this um, because it relates to the Anarch Free State here. Um, so the establishment, you could very easily if you wanted to, and you are going straight up 5th uh, edition, could retcon out uh, the Quaishin or the promise, uh, the new promise, uh, Man Mandinar 8 being things that are there, that the free states could have fallen to their own infighting or something like that. Um, because certainly there was a lot of infighting that could have caused uh, pressures from the outside world to cause them to fall anyway. Regardless of that, things with the Camarilla and the Sabbat. And their resurgence now you, you know, just because the free state's gone doesn't mean uh, the isn't still the remnants of it there. Uh, but that's up to you for your own storyline as a final little note on all of this, a little punctuation to this entire thing. But I hope you enjoyed learning about the Anarchs and the Anarch movement. Uh, they're a very interesting group as they have been around for a long time but have always been kind of like this fringes of society that have kind of been considered parts of other vampire groups. And this new resurgence into we're our own group is something that I think is been deserved of them. They needed to find their own way, find their own thing. And honestly speaking, their idealisms and a lot of the concepts that they live by are fairly interesting and impressive ones the idea of even if you can't get like a democracy a little bit more of a, a a meritocracy you know where you know what you do matters a lot more than who you are and things like that seemingly is a very interesting concept for vampires and especially for you know making their society maybe a little better maybe a little bit more secured maybe a little bit ready for things that happen in the future, for stuff like the Second Inquisition. They are the forefront of a lot of groups, and honestly, because of perhaps their still wanting to keep things like the Masquerade, but having this more modern sensibility, the modern world isn't as scary or a threat or a problem for them as it has been for a lot of vampires. The rise and strength in the last century of the Anarch movement is one to understand and be impressed with. And yeah, there are good reasons to play any sect, whether you're a certain clan. But honestly, the Anarch movement is a very interesting one to look at nowadays, just with how we as a society and a world are. And to see them that they have um, much more so than the Sabbat or the Camarilla. They are finding a better way to be a little bit more human. Perhaps that's where you have to look at it. Where they don't embrace the beast. They don't hide the beast. They learn to live with it. Because it's something that's there. A little bit more than the Camarilla. Maybe that's what the Anarch movement is. Maybe. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed learning about them today and this dive into them. The Anarch movement is a very interesting one and one that is great to uh, take a look at. Um, it tells us a lot about how vampire society can evolve. Uh, I hope you did enjoy everything. Remember, I talk about tabletop live on Twitch if you want to see me live and join in the conversation every Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon and Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings tend to be my World of Darkness stuff. Um, 
Also, if you're checking this out on YouTube, hi, thanks YouTube, great to have you here. Remember to follow, like, comment, subscribe, uh, or so, 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 subscribe, like, comment, ring the bell, all those great things to keep you informed about when I have stuff for the bell. Uh, the comments, you know, great way to ch chat about this. Have you played an Anarch before? That's my question for the day. Um, and uh, also, you know, give a little follow on Twitch if you want to watch there. So those are all great places to check me out. I hope you also enjoyed. Uh, other places, there's always great places to support me in other ways. Um, if you want to see what I'm doing and stuff like that, I've got Discord, a Twitter. I have some random brain fart moments on those and also let my people know my schedule and stuff like that. Um, I think that's it. I think it's all my spiel. Anyway, use about the air. Vampires, creatures of darkness, members of the world of, uh, of the night. I bid all of you out there a wonderful and great rest of your day and say farewell. <laughs>